My name's Keith Valentine, and I am absolutely over the moon to be introducing our new Director of Social Impact, Ellie Southwood. Ellie, good morning. Morning, Keith. Absolutely thrilled to be here. So we are um, a new charity. We have a legacy of uh, Vision Foundation, which has been invested in social impact and fight for sight, investing in the science. I just wondered, Ellie, um, as I know you've rehearsed many answers through the tough time we gave you in the interview process, <laughs> if you could say a bit about what excites you about joining our new organisation. Oh, where to start, Keith? So, I mean, I think there's a real energy about the bringing together of two organisations, which in their own right, each has a lot of respect uh, within the sector and, and more widely too. So I think there's something really sort of energised about the feeling of joining um, a newly created organisation. And I think that the roles that each of the organisations that are coming together plays are just so complementary. It's always something we've struggled with in the sector, isn't it? Having that conversation, which is both about opportunities for treatment, but also about the quality of life that anyone who is losing some or all of their sight or never had any to start with, the quality of life that we can live. Absolutely, Ellie. And, um, and I hope you don't mind me taking this line of question. You and I both live with visual impairment. Mine degenerated through my 30s, and I know you've lived with it right the way through your education. I wonder if you could just say a little bit about, you know, what it what it means to work in the cause that um, people, the very many people like you and I are impacted by in our daily lives. It, it, it's a it's a funny question for me because I think if you'd asked me 15 years ago, I would have said absolutely no way, never. You know, I live this life. Why on earth would I want to spend my working hours focused on it as well? I think. You know, and, and there are plenty of blind and partially sighted people who make that choice. And I really understand that because I think there is an additional, you know, potentially an additional sort of emotional burden of that as well. It, you know, you live it 24 seven and then to work in it, in, in it as well. However, I um, at a point in my late 20s was working as a headhunter and met the then chair of RNIB and spent the precious hour I had with him telling him everything that was wrong with not just RNIB but the wider sector too um, and why you know it was all old-fashioned didn't resonate with me you know it was just not something that spoke to me at all and he of course called my bluff and said well you know you can you can either be in it to make it better uh, or you can stand you, you know you stand on the sidelines and carry on whinging about it which really called my bluff so I became a trustee at RNIB and, and then later chair and, and really over that time developed an incredible understanding of passion for our sector and the work in it and just a, a real admiration of lots of the people who day in day out are working you know across across the UK to to provide services in many cases for people who are very underserved very you know some parts of our country the support that's available if you're losing your sight is absolutely pitiful, clinical and service wise. So I just, you know, it's, it's really inspiring to be part of a group of people who are just determined to change that. So, and that certainly I, I feel that and you're, you're joining a team that will be both energised by your outlook and I hopefully will energise you um, too. I, I, I always take the view that the critical thing, if you've got that kind of environment, is that you make the right choices to get change and to get impact and I wondered what your hopes were for the kind of things you'd like to take forward in terms of impact as you join our organisation. One of the things that's super exciting about this role and, and the newly merged organisation is, is the focus on what we're there for. So the focus on our role as funder and investor and I think very often organisations who are working with blind and partially sighted people, efforts on the clinical side too, are hampered by short-term funding, um, funding that doesn't really touch the sides. And also, I, I think we, one of the things that we will be able to do is bring together a lot of thinking on where that funding is really making a difference. So what are the investments that we should be making that are going to transform the experience either of uh, seeking treatment for an eye condition or of living, 
you know, your life as somebody who's blind or partially sighted. I think we're in a unique position to do that. And I think that it will have the uh, it has the, the potential to really, I think, create quite a sea change in the um, the way that uh, life is lived across the UK if you're blind or partially sighted. Absolutely. I, I, it's just just listening to you there, that that kind of sense of our ability to start to look for a role in helping the sector and the system solve problems that I think probably you and I have seen for you know many years. I mean, we're both, yeah. I think, you know, in, in the different roles we've had where we've worked together and alongside each other over the years, the question of employment and the levels of um, unemployment amongst the working age population has been troubling. And we know some of those stats about people that come through their education with visual impairment do really well um, in their exams but don't necessarily do as well as they go into the workforce and uh, I wonder if you could reflect on that for a bit clearly employment will be big for us it should be um, but uh, I just you know wonder how that again back to that question how that feels for you to work on that given that you've had a successful career and yet as of I and we know that there are people there that perhaps have not made it through what you think we should be doing we've been hand wringing about this issue for 40 years or so and huge efforts have been made projects have been run to, that have all you know had some degree of, of success in the in the moment but what we have not done is shifted those statistics in any meaningful way so I think there is a really in some ways it's simple and in some ways it's deeply complex. I think one of the things that makes this issue so challenging and where we could really have an impact is on the perceptions that blind and partially sighted people have of themselves and expectations of what is possible. And those expectations are you know, inherited from the world around us. So we talk a lot about you know, the understanding of sight loss generally in the population being quite low. And, and we know why, because it, whilst it's the sense people most fear losing, it's also the one that is incomprehensible for people to imagine not having. So conceptually, it's really challenging for people to think, oh, how would I do this if I couldn't see? There's all sorts of yeah. things that people attach to that, you know, an assumption that that means you also wouldn't know anything, and an assumption you also wouldn't be able to make any judgments. So if that's what the general population thinks, then it's no surprise that when somebody starts to lose their sight, they too have those perceptions. So I think I think it's working with people to understand and to have um, higher expectations of what the world should deliver for them in terms of opportunity, yeah. definitely something that I think we probably haven't focused on enough in the past. We've focused very much on getting employers to employ people, which is obviously essential because without that, there's no outcome. But I think really working on the, um, you know, on the side of blind and partially sighted people would be something that we haven't done on a large scale before. Um, and, and one of the things that's super exciting about this role is we can, you know, we can fund things which can be almost incubators. So let's try new ideas. Mm. And if they work, we have a great evidence base then to either seek additional funding. Um, there's plenty of money out there. We just need it to come into our sector so that we can, you know, support. <laughs> um, so, you know, we can make a very strong case and we can scale up and really look at how to focus on the system as well, as well as the projects that might help, you know, up to 10 people get a job, for, for example. Yeah, I, absolutely. And I, I think that it was interesting. Uh, you and I had the conversation last week around moving the social impact work we do from being just a London focus to, yeah. you know, a national focus. And um, the we've commissioned some research to look at how um, blind and visually impaired people may be experiencing loneliness and isolation. I think that's particularly, um, you know, of concern and interest since the pandemic with the all of the things we went through there. And I, I wonder if you could say a bit about that, because you had some interesting thoughts about how perhaps rural isolation hadn't been looked at in the same yeah. way as a, those sorts of things. I, I think times are really tough for, for people at the moment. And, and of course, that includes blind and partially sighted people. And some of that is post pandemic stuff. I, I think some of it is things that already existed that the pandemic has brought into sharp relief. 
And I think some of it is that actually, you know, for many people, for all of us probably, going out and about and stuff is it can feel like quite hard work and quite relentlessly sort of energy sapping. So if you don't do that for 18 months, I think you lose the you sort of lose the muscle memory almost and the confidence. So there's a lot of um, issues, I think, for people at the moment. And, you know, plus move to hybrid remote working, which those of us who live in areas with with fantastic broadband connections can really jump on. And that's a, a huge opportunity for us. Many parts of England do not have good broadband connections. So there's another barrier created there. Many parts of England do not have adequate public transport. I mean, for you and I, um, you know, jumping on a train and going somewhere on and off the tube, it's super easy. It could not be easier, except, you know, but but for a lot of people, that, that option just isn't there. So getting to a job becomes enough of a barrier for somebody, you know, not, not really ever to, to be able to do it. Yeah. Absolutely. And, and Ellie, look, I, I, I'm really, really conscious that you don't start with us until the 5th of July and you've always, <laughs> or, and I'm getting every every penny I can out of you in advance of you starting. So just for a bit of fun before we finish. Yeah. And I'll, 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 I'll tell you a little story about something you might not know about me. And then afterwards, I'll ask you if you've got anything you'd like to say that people might not know about you. So oh, one wow. of the funny one of the funny things when I lost my eyesight was that um, a few of my friends got really into kind of um, showing me things that, that I couldn't see anymore that were new to me. Now, what I mean by that is they got obsessed with the fact that, um, you know, I'd never been close to like a wild animal. Now, I don't know who in the world had been close to a wild animal, but <laughs> it's just right. like somehow they think, I think it's because they think we're like superheroes because you lose your sight. Anyway, so they arranged for me to go um, um, into a closer pen in London Zoo near a, near a tiger. Oh my like that, God. With the idea that I could pet the tiger, not realising that I'm actually allergic to tigers. Now, I don't mean that I'm allergic to tigers in the sense if they bite me, it hurts. I think we're all allergic in that way. But I actually ended up with my eyes swelling up and, uh, you know, like losing breath and whatever else. So the thing that people don't know about, well, two things. Firstly, my friends, whilst lovely, are also a little bit silly sometimes. Uh, and the second thing is I'm allergic to tigers. Ellie, what, what, might, <laughs> the, what might be true of you that we don't yet know? <laughs> Wowzers. Um... I definitely don't know how I can possibly follow that. What a thing to learn. I mean, <laughs> you might never have known that. I'm pretty open. So people know most things about me. I do have a habit of sort of retelling embarrassing stories about myself kind of too a bit too much. So I think people end up knowing all sorts of things about me that um, uh, that other people would perhaps uh, keep, you know, keep to themselves to minimise the embarrassment. I, I, so I, I can say something that, that I know about you that other people don't, which is that you're super into your running. <laughs> and that, that um, part, you're a part run superhero. Um, I mean, well superhero, superhero obviously is the obviously. <laughs> well, that was uh, one of the stories that you told. So whether you've exaggerated a bit, I don't know. Yeah, that's there might have been a glass of wine involved. <laughs> yeah, no. So I, I mean, I, I, from being somebody who, at school, was completely not into sport. I, I um, had a mixture of schooling, both specialist and mainstream. So I moved into mainstream education when I was about seven, and Although I was, you know, as most children are kind of lively and active up until I was 10 or 11 and rode a bike and my sister, who's also blind, we each of us had bikes. And I just remember my dad, I mean, how his heart stood it, I, I don't know, but he used to take us out on the bikes and just shout instructions at us using the clock face. So he'd say, wow. you know, a little bit 11 o'clock, a little bit 11 o'clock. There's only once I remember him really shouting three o'clock immediately. Um, so that must have done his blood pressure no good um but when I moved into secondary school I um was totally not sporty PE was quite hard for me I felt it was quite hard um it was hard to join in especially because I was kind of rubbish at it so it wasn't like I had a natural ability that made it easier for me to 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 join in um and I I'm afraid to say that I used it as an opportunity to opt out so I um, made a case that I should instead go to the library and read instead of doing any PE and I you know I do feel a little bit ashamed about that when I look back on it because we know how important physical education is but I just felt like yeah. in the midst of everything else I was doing to access the curriculum it just felt like one thing too many 
So I was nearly 40 when I got taken along to a sort of walk to run group by a friend after we'd been having a conversation, probably over a glass of wine, saying we wanted to get fitter. And um, and and it went from there, really. I found an amazing group of women who were happy to guide me in running. I went to my first park run. And yeah, I'm really into it now. And I've just done my first triathlon. So um, I, I remain slow and not very um, naturally sporty. But what I've learned is that you don't need permission to do this stuff. And it doesn't matter if you're rubbish. It's the doing of it that matters. What makes you a, a runner is whether you run or not. So I think, you know, I definitely run. So, <laughs> uh, Ellie, we as an organisation are absolutely delighted that you are joining us. And I think, you know, we are going to get some great work done. It's an absolute pleasure talking to you this morning and we are looking forward to you starting with Vision Foundation Fight for Sight. Thank you very much. I cannot wait. Thanks Keith.